Thanks a lot for that, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have an interactive morning today, so get used to using your voices a little bit, please. Um, water is the most important resource that we have on the planet. Um, let me say that again. Water is the most important resource we have on the planet. That's for us as individuals, for our communities, for society, uh, for the environment. And I'm really, really thrilled to be here this morning with a fabulous panel and a room full of people who are energized and eager to talk about the future of water on World Water Day. So happy World Water Day as well to, to everyone. Um, it's great to see all of you here and also to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Um, our event this morning is co-hosted by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine and the Pew Charitable Trust. We've had a great uh, collaboration with them over the past number of weeks in putting this session together. I'm Elizabeth Ada, and I direct the Water Science and Technology Board here at the National Academies, and I'll be moderating the session for you all this morning. We have a packed 90 minutes where we're going to be doing a lot of interaction with you as well as with our panel, and so I'd like to run through the program for you just so you have an idea of what's in store um, before we get underway. We'll spend about the first 20 to 25 minutes with the panel, uh, hearing from them uh, about what they've written in this uh, magazine that you have in front of you there, the Trend Magazine, as well as other issues that they see of importance in terms of water security. And then we'd like to turn over to a 20-minute period of Q&A with all of you. Um, and what we'd like to ask all of you to do is, if you have questions, there's one standing mic over there. Um, if you could line up at that mic if you have questions for the panelists. For those of you on this side of the room, so you don't have to hoof it all the way across the, the floor, we have a mic that Brendan is holding in the back. It's actually a tossing mic. So hopefully you will be able to catch the mic and then you speak into the top of the mic. It's really easy. It doesn't transmit while it's in the air. It only transmits once you have it in your hands. So if you have questions, you're not able to get over to the standing mic there, please raise your hand and, and Brendan will get that microphone to you. Um, after, uh, during that, that Q&A period, we're also going to try to engage those of you who aren't getting up to the mics but want to participate. We're going to put up some, some polling questions on the screens here. So this is the one time when the moderator pleads with you to get your phones out and to use them. So everyone should, and you can do this now, um, get your phones out. Make sure the sound is off, though. Um, and we will be putting, uh, in a moment, putting a, a question up for you to get yourselves, uh, there it is, get yourselves logged into the, the, the Poll Everywhere uh, question. You can see you can can go into the, the, your browser and on the left-hand side, it's in the red, your, your, uh, your, your ability to get onto the, the poll everywhere. And uh, you can text or you can go in through the browser. This is just a demographic question for us to, to see who's in the audience here and make sure that everyone can get on onto the system. If you have trouble getting onto the system, you'll have several other chances during the morning here. And if you really have difficulty, pop your hand up and someone on our staff team can come over and, and help you out. And the instructions are also in the, in the, the program that you have with you. Um, the, after we do that second set of poll everywhere questions, we're using the, the questions and the responses to them in part to help trigger another round of discussion with the panel for about 20 minutes. And we'll wrap up with about 15 minutes of Q&A again with all of you and a, and a final poll everywhere question. Um, and we hope that everyone will engage and, and, and put questions forward to this great panel that we have here this morning. I think you all saw that we are going to be tweeting this session this morning, so if you are so inclined, uh, please feel free to tweet. Use the hashtag, uh, futureh2o is the hashtag, and I think you all saw the, the ability to get onto the Wi-Fi system too. So what do we have here? Um, uh, so far, the poll questions were showing about half the room or half the audience, including the online audience, is from the non-governmental uh, area, another proportion equally from federal government and other. So please keep the, the polling going there. And while you're, you're finishing up your, your responses to the poll, I'd like to introduce our panelists. You all have the full biographies in your program, so I'm not going to go through those in detail. I'll just give a, a couple of highlights. And you'll definitely see the experience and knowledge that we have here on the stage as, as the panelists are, are giving their remarks. So I'll start to my left here. 
Jay Familietti is Professor and Executive Director at the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan, where he also holds the Canada 150 Research Chair of Hydrology and Remote Sensing. Jay recently moved to Canada uh, after a long career in the U.S., including time with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and at, at UC Irvine. Tom Dillon, to Jay's left, is Vice President and Head of Environment with the Pew Charitable Trust. He oversees Pew's conservation portfolio, and prior to joining Pew, Tom was with the World Wildlife Fund, and I think uh, Tom's interest and passion for conservation will, will really be evident in his remarks. And finally, uh, Sandra Postel, um, uh, all the way at, at, on the left there, is currently the director of the Global Water Policy Project and is an accomplished author of numerous water-related uh, books and articles, had been with the National Geographic as well, and she's been uh, quite involved in several well-known uh, documentary series with D BBC and the National Geographic Channel. And a number of you might uh, be familiar with one of her books, called uh, Replenish, the Virtuous Cycle of Water Prosperity. You yeah, have a, I can, uh, you can show and tell. You can do a, a free, a free advertising <laughs> there. Um, all three, as you know, are well known for their work with, with water issues, and we're really excited to have them here this morning. Um, so I think with that, we have yeah, the poll results uh, still in a strong proportion from the non-governmental uh, area. And I think everyone, just quick nods from the room, most people who tried were able to get on. Yes, okay, I'm seeing that, that's great. So stay, you don't have to log in again when the next question comes up, you'll be able to, to just respond uh, and, and through, through your phone um, directly. So with that said, um, not everyone has had the advantage that I did with a, a, an advanced copy of Trend Magazine. So what we're going to do is turn over to our panelists and ask them each to spend about five minutes talking briefly about what they wrote in their trend article, as well as the high-level high issues that they see as very pressing in terms of water and water security. And with that, I think I'll turn directly over to Jay first, then Tom, and then Sandra. So Jay, please. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, so it's great to be here, and happy World Water Day. Um, uh, so let's not forget while we're here. And I just want to share with you my perspective. And my perspective uh, can easily be understood by looking at my, my cup here. Um, which is clearly half empty. Okay? <laughs> uh, so, um, just you know, wanted you to know in which direction we're headed uh, with with my remarks. When I think about the future of water, I think about this map uh, that's that's behind me and that we're looking at, and what that what uh, what it implies. This map was really the capstone contribution. In fact. Uh, uh, it may be the capstone contribution of the NASA GRACE satellite mission, which flew from about this time, launched on St. Patrick's Day in 2002, uh, to the end of 2017. It shows how freshwater storage changed during that 15-year lifetime of the mission. Uh, just let me give some brief background on GRACE, because uh, it and other technology advances on the on the technology side do give me some hope for the future. GRACE was really a satellite mission like, like none other. GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Rather than taking images of the Earth's surface, it measured the very tiny variations in space and time in Earth's gravity field. And those tiny variations are primarily caused by the movement of water over the Earth that we know as the water cycle. So rains here, it snows over there, some water stirred on the ground, some water infiltrates into the ground, some of it runs off into rivers, into the ocean, and then evaporates back uh, uh, into the atmosphere, and so it goes. Grace, grace really effectively functioned like a scale in the sky, uh, essentially weighing the large regions of the world that are gaining or losing water mass on monthly and longer time scales. Having those novel gravity measurements allowed the GRACE science team to produce maps like this one. And for my colleagues and my collaborators and my students and myself to evaluate, understand, and interpret what this thing means for our global water future. This map shows how Earth's freshwater storage, uh, So, and when I say that word, I mean uh, all of the snow, surface water, soil, moisture, and groundwater together changed during the mission's 15-year lifetime. And it has profound implications for how it will continue to change. 
blue colors in this map, by the way, mean increasing water storage over this 15-year period, and the reds mean decreasing. So we can see, or I can see after studying it for 15 years, that uh, just as the IPCC predicted, the wet areas of the world, those at high latitudes and those in the tropics, are getting wetter. And the dry areas of the world, those in between, the mid-latitudes, are getting drier. And we can see that it's happening now um, and not you know, the IPCC projections are for the end of the 21st century, but we're seeing it happen now. Um, we can see, we can quantify the rates of ice sheet melt. We can see that in Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, Alpine glacier melts, you look at Alaska, uh, look down at the southern tip of South America and Patagonia, look around the Himalayas. Um, so we can uh, quantify rates of alpine glacier melt. We can see where flooding and drought are changing. There's a big blue spot there over the upper Missouri River Basin, which happens to be flooding right now. Um, and we can see that groundwater depletion is a major global phenomenon. We've shown that over half of the world's major aquifers, many of which are shown as bright red hotspots in this map, so the Central Valley in California, the southern part of the Ogallala Aquifer, uh, the, the uh, uh, North Africa, uh, the Northern Sahara Aquifer System, the Middle East, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the North China Plain in Beijing, India, um, and into uh, Bangladesh. Uh, all of these are past sustainability tipping points because their water is being mined primarily to fuel irrigation. So what are some of the implications? On this World Water Day, I hope that this map serves as a wake-up call. I don't believe that our society is really prepared for the water, the feud, and the energy future that that this map confronts us with. We can see that global freshwater security and therefore global food security is at far greater risk than we ever imagined. We know that distinct classes of water, haves and have-nots, are emerging, and we know that that's a gateway to more violent conflict and to more and more climate and water refugees. I don't think we're going to tech our way out of this with desalination or squeezing water out of the air or finding new uh, <clears throat> magical sources of water with unicorns jumping through rainbows. Uh, our global water future, I mean, you see that in commercials, right? And, uh, our global water future is much more complicated than that, and it re requires a level of long-term planning and attention that's really on par with international relations and diplomacy. It's not going to happen overnight. So there are solutions. Let me switch from the half uh, empty glass to the half full or from the dark side to the bright side. It's hard for me, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, there are so many things that we can do to manage our way to a sustainable global water future. Some are technological for sure. Uh, the GRACE follow-on mission, which follows the original GRACE mission, launched in May 2018. It will continue to provide GRACE data like those that I've shown you. We can vastly improve irrigation efficiency. We can vastly reduce food waste. There are socioeconomic solutions, political solutions, nature-based solutions that Sandra will, will talk about. Um, in my opinion, we're under-institutionalized in the area of global water security. We need to bring governments, civil society, academics, and the private sector together to collaborate in these many regions for water insecurity that we see on this map. We also need to be thinking about how we can do it globally. In closing, our global water future, just like climate change and so many other environmental issues, is a shared one. We can come together to work on it. We have a map of where the future of water is headed. We have no choice but to change the course. Thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> Turn to you, Tom, please. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm it's a pleasure to be here with all of you on World Water Day and to follow Jay and his really illuminating map. Um, my first understanding of the possibility of unintentional consequences from manipulating natural water flows occurred when I lived in Cairo, Egypt as a kid. At that time, schistomiasis, a disease caused by parasitic worms and freshwater snails, infected 40% of the population. While it had existed in Egypt for thousands of years, it was the building of the Aswan Dam in 1967 that was believed to have exacerbated the prevalence due to snails in the irrigation system. 
created by the dam. Years later, uh, I was working in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand in the 1990s, setting up the World Wildlife Fund's program there, which was focused on forest and endangered species conservation. But the Mekong River, second only to the Amazon in fish biodiversity, is the pulsing lifeblood of that region. The sediment-laden delta, its rice bowl, and it's the world's largest inland fishery worth an estimated $17 billion a year, feeding a minimum of 60 million mostly poor people uh, in lower Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia. But dams started proliferating while I lived there as those countries post-war started to open up, cooperate with one another, need more energy. China built several across the main stem of the upper Mekong. Laos did the same. Major tributaries became dammed in Cambodia. Overall, more than 100 dams were planned in the system. Food security and biodiversity were threatened. In response, we pivoted our work from forests to the health of the Mekong River and its ecosystem services. Cambodia would have been, and still will be, especially hard hit if all the plans come into reality. Few countries in the world are more dependent on fish consumption than Cambodia, where fish provide 80% of the population's protein. Vietnam is already seeing salinization of the delta as a result of what's happening to the river. So therefore, decisions made by upstream countries, such as China, are affecting downstream ones in ways that have become major national security concerns. Decisions made upstream and their potential for impacting natural systems was the topic of my article and trend. Take Australia's channel country, which the article centered on, which covers one-sixth of that nation. It spans four states and is considered one of the largest internal drainage systems in the world. This expansive wilderness is the site of one of the planet's most spectacular natural phenomena. Following periodic heavy rainfall, the three river systems that comprise the basin flood inland thousands of miles, moving life-giving water from the country's tropical north to the arid center of Australia. And over the course of several weeks, runoff from the torrential rains transform the landscape entirely, from one that is desiccated to one that is alive with plants and wildlife and literally millions of migrating birds that somehow, even though it can have been years since they were last there, know that the rains have come to the, and, and they can um, migrate into the center of Australia. It may, even uh, birds, of course, that have passed this on generation to generation. So it's quite a natural phenomenon. Sometimes um, these deluges only occur every five to six years. So the Channel Country is like some other, what I believe are uh, amazing natural systems, such as the Pantanal in South America, the Okavango Delta in Botswana, that illustrate the benefit uh, to nature sometimes of very large scale inland floods. It can seem counterintuitive to think of flooding on this scale to be beneficial with floodwaters creating the vegetation, however, upon which ranchers in Australia depend. And, um, and su it supports the local economy there, as well as the largest concentration of wildlife in the country. In fact, ranchers in Australia rely so heavily on the unimpeded flow of water that they've joined with conservationists like Pew and others to combat threats, such as those posed by large-scale irrigation and fracking. For as vast and remote as the Channel Country is, it's still a fragile ecosystem. It's a flat, even flat area, and even seemingly benign activities, such as road building, can significantly alter the pathway of the water and have ripple effects through the whole greater landscape. As the threats to our global water supply intensify, I believe it's absolutely critical that systems such as the Channel Country are left as intact as possible. While Pew doesn't have an explicit water program, we are advancing 
wild and scenic river designations here in the U.S. And our Flood Prepared Communities Initiative promotes green infrastructure and flood insurance reform in the face of climate change. Some of our terrestrial work, such as in Australia or in Canada, where our goal in the Boreal Forest is to conserve one billion acres, are very intertwined with water. The boreal contains more wa surface water than any other continental scale landscape, and some parts of it are going to in increase, it seems, um, from Jay's map. It has half the world's lakes that are larger than a square kilometer, 25% of the world's wetlands, the world's single largest remaining unpolluted freshwater body, the Great Bear Lake. In essence, this massive terrestrial initiative is a water initiative. As most of you would know, protecting these large-scale ecosystems helps mitigate against the threats of climate change, as well as maintain abundant biodiversity. Today, I hope to learn from my fellow panelists. I'm here with two of the greatest water experts in the world, and this distinguished audience, which is also full of wonderful water experts, about additional ways that Pew might be able to advance water conservation, as well as contribute more broadly to solving water security problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Sandra, please. So I think most of us, and good morning and happy World Water Day. It's great to see some old friends and meet some new people, and I'm really looking forward to your involvement with our, with our discussion this morning. Um, I think most of us would agree that water management over the last century has been extraordinarily successful. Um, you know, I have a hard time imagining the, a global population of, what are we now, 7.6 nearly billion people. Um, 75 trillion economic activity going back and forth without this water infrastructure. 58,000 large dams around the world, controlling floods, generating hydro, storing water. Um, the equivalent of something like 10 Colorado rivers moving to cities to help eat, meet urban demands through pipelines and canals and so on. Uh, lifting lots and lots of water from deep underground using enormously large pumps. So it's been incredibly successful, I think, from an engineering point of view. And it's, it's allowed desert cities. It's allowed these mega cities to grow. It's allowed incredible amount of, of food production in some very, very dry places. But if you think about it, and I think we're beginning to see this now, today, even looking at what's happening in the Midwest, this kind of for lack of a better term, sort of command and control kind of approach to water management has entailed what I think of as kind of a Faustian bargain. You know, it's, it's brought this enormous prosperity, and yet at the same time, it's literally broken the water cycle, locally, regionally, and increasingly, it seems, globally. And so we have this dilemma. You know, we have this experience of this great success in the way that we've been doing it, but it's clear that that's not going to work anymore going forward. And so I come back to often to something Albert Einstein reminded us of decades ago, that we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And so that is the challenge, I think, for all of us in this room, is what is that new way of thinking about water? Um, if we can't do, the, do it the old way, and it's tempting to do that. I mean, we think bigger dams, bigger diversions, more water moving around is going to solve it, but we know it's not. But what is that new thinking? And I, just to throw out my two thoughts on what, what this needs to entail. The first is recognizing that um, we, as a society, as individuals, can live happy, healthy, productive lives while consuming less water. And shrinking the human water footprint has to be top of mind. Um, if we're an average American, you know, we're consuming 10,000 gallons of water a day. Half of it is hidden in our diet. A third of it is in our energy. Everything in this room took water to make, all the clothes I'm wearing, all the paper we're using. And so shrinking that water footprint is doable through conservation, really intensive efficiency improvements, 
and more conscious consumption on the part of everyone. So, so that's part of it, I think, is shrinking that footprint. The second change, I think, has to involve working more with the natural world and the functioning of ecosystems rather than against it, which is pretty much what we've been doing for most of the last half century, or more, more like century. I think of nature and natural ecosystems as our most underutilized asset when it comes to water security. Um, and if you think about, just a couple quick examples, think about what New York City has done for the last 20 years. They've invested $1.7 billion in watershed protection, allowing the watershed to do the storing and the cleansing of water, and saved $10 billion because they didn't have to build a filtration plant. So that's an economic success. It's an environmental success. It has repaired and protected that part of the water cycle. One example, um, we're seeing you know, this week the, the hor horrific effects of, of disconnecting rivers from floodplains and levying and, and not allowing that natural part of the water cycle to operate anymore. Um, and again, for good reasons. We have incredibly productive farmland in a lot of these areas, small rural towns. But with these incredibly intense floods that are coming, followed by drought. Remember the 2011 flood was the last big one that Missouri saw before this one, and it was followed by a horrific drought in the same area. And that water had flooded off instead of been captured by wetlands and then replenished those rivers the next year. So we had that double whammy effect, and we're going to see more and more of this. So again, not using nature. Um, you know, we saw this incredible record um, weather and disaster related uh, events in 2017. NOAA put the number at $306 billion in weather and, and, and climate related disasters in the US only, just in the US. The top three of those were Hurricane Harvey, Hur Hurricane Maria, and Hurricane Rita. And that's not going to be an outlier number for much longer. The new, uh, the new climate report that came out of the US said we're likely to see those hundreds of billions of dollars in damages as a more routine uh, degree of, of damage later in this century. So that's not going to be an outlier, outlier number forever. So what I did in my essay in Trend, and it's, it draws from, from my book, is really to talk about those real things happening on the ground that show we can do this differently, that show we can actually have prosperity while we work with nature, with the water cycle, repair the water cycle, um, that it doesn't have to be an either or kind of situation. Um, this river is one of my favorites. I, so I tell stories from and examples from Australia, Europe, China, India, much of the United States, Mexico. Um, but this is one of my favorites. It's close to home. It's the Verde River in, in north central Arizona. And it's becoming kind of a poster child of what river restoration can look like and how it can be done. Uh, this is one of, I would say, the three desert rivers in the southwest that is absolutely crucial to migratory birds, to uh, you know, obviously wildlife. It is, you know, it is a lifeline in the desert. But like most rivers in the western U.S., has been depleted by taking all the water out of the river uh, during the irrigation season. So five, six, seven, eight miles would be completely dry. And just to summarize what's been done over a period of only 10 years, um, is upgrades in the irrigation infrastructure, automated head gates that allow irrigators to take just the water they need instead of taking the whole river, leave the rest for the river. Um, changes in points of diversion and switches in crops away from the intensive alfalfa to more water efficient barley. That's supporting the barley malt facility that's new there and feeding uh, inputs into the Arizona brewing industry. So, so when you look at what's happening there, you see a healthier river that's good for the community, good for uh, recreation and tourism, good for fish and wildlife, um, and a modernized irrigation system that's benefiting uh, the irrigators. And so there's, there's a win-win-win, not a win-lose situation in that. I, I don't see any downside, but it takes investment um, in that. And current policy does not support what's happening there. This is an outlier because money came in from different sources. It wasn't that policy is yet supporting uh, this kind of activity. I'm um, in California. Two more of the quick examples. In California, we have farmers and irrigation districts working with scientists on using wintertime stormwater to begin recharging the depleted aquifers in California. 
Is it going to solve that problem? No. It might solve a quarter of it if it's done right and done well. But it's not going to solve it, but it's going to help if we can do more of that. And it's looking fairly promising. Um, China, look at our urban water systems. China has launched at the national level you know, a sponge city initiative to try to repair the urban water cycle. Yet you know, cities looking and, and operating more like sponges, the way the landscape would have absorbed rainfall before the hard surfaces came in. They now have 30 cities in this pilot phase with a goal of capturing 70% of the stormwater and having it recharge into the ground. We'll see if that's a very ambitious target. We'll see what, what happens. But it's an effort to repair the urban water cycle, prepare for more intense floods and, and droughts. So these are the kinds of examples I think we can learn from, can help us make that, that mindset shift, um, and then figure out what policies we need to adopt to scale all this up. So I have my glass half empty days, but I have a lot of glass half full days. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much to all three of you. So we have uh, clearly have a problem on our hands, um, but we also thankfully have some solutions. And we will get into the solution space significantly as we go through the, the rest of our, our morning here. But I wanted to do a, a quick question before we turn over to some, some questions that your opening remarks might have raised. So I encourage the audience to start thinking about questions you want to ask our panelists. But I wanted to, and, and because we are here at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, it would be odd if I didn't ask a question about, about science and technology and the role that that has in, in this problem. Clearly, science and technology, we're not going to, as you said, Jay, tech our way out of, out of this. That's, that's clearly not the, the, the solution. But it has, science and technology have a role to play. I wondered if each of you could just talk a little bit about um, the frontiers for science and technology. There are a lot of interconnected systems we're, we're used to studying in our, in our areas, but, but we're talking about interconnected systems now. So I wondered if you could just uh, talk a little bit about where you see the frontiers for science and technology, where we need to go, where we should be taking things. And maybe, Jay, if it's all right, I might yeah. start with you. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, important to, to consider the role of science and technology. And although I did say we're not going to tech our way out of it, we have to really try to uh, tech the heck out of it to, to move forward. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of things that, that, uh, that are being worked on that are, that are really quite innovative. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to focus in on your point about how we have to start um, thinking about these problems jointly. So it's not just a water problem because, you know, desalination is a good example of when you think of it as just a water problem and don't think about what you're going to do with the brine, you know, that's not really a holistic solution. Um, one of the, so I'll make a plug for, um, for uh, investment in, in research. Um, but no, I'll make a, a uh, two plugs. One for investment in research because we need to be, uh, my community, the modeling and predictive community needs to be building these integrated tools that we can share with decision makers to explore the, the option space. And it's really hard to pull all those together. Um, it's hard to pull in the food and the energy and the water and the social behavior and, and health. It's just really difficult to uh, 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 to pull it all together, so it takes a, uh, takes a big investment. The other um, thing that I think we need to be thinking about, which is sort of uber integrative, is um, investment in uh, emergency funding and making sure uh, sort of nation by nation that there is enough funding available uh, to recover from the flood and then the drought that happens, right, that, follow, that follows the flood. And so... Uh, we need to be thinking about, about that because the frequency of the flooding and drought is going to become a major challenge to recovery. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jay. Sandra or Tom, did you want to? Yeah, I'll add a couple of that. I think uh, while I talk about nature-based solutions, I think science and technology have an enormous role to play. Um, we can't manage with ecosystems in mind if we don't understand how ecosystems really function. So understanding the science of ecosystem services, of ecosystem functioning, getting as good of an understanding of that as we can in every way is critical, I think, to, to this. Um, you know, in terms of technology, I mean, a couple of the ones that come to my mind, Elizabeth, when you ask the question, 
you know, I write about, um, you know, this technique that's, that's starting to expand in irrigations, particularly with center pivot irrigation, which is more and more common around the world, you know, is this variable rate irrigation, right, where you have sensors out in the field that can give you real-time information on how much water you really need to apply to a field, how much, how much water is actually already in the soil, um, what areas don't need any irrigation at all, then you can program, you know, your center pivot that's equipped with a GPS, and it delivers, you know, it tailors the water delivery much more directly to the field conditions. Well, if you're save, if it's saving 15% of your water in irrigated agriculture, that's a lot of water. So if we, can, if we can begin to apply you know, information technology and marry that with efficiency technology um, in irrigation, we can, we can save a lot of water. So that's, that's an area where I think technology can really grow. On the pollution side and, and treatment side, we've seen enormous improvements in, in reverse osmosis technologies and the membrane technologies, and I think we're going to need more and more of that. You know, we're going to be able to get the, you know, the, the uh, PFAS chemicals out um, of that we're now discovering, um, we might be able to do that with more sophisticated membranes. So we'll see. But I think those areas of water quality and water, you know, uh, efficiency in particular are going to need tremendous improvements and spreading of of technology. Thanks, Sandra. And Tom, please. I'm really um, happy that Sandra was talking about agriculture because, of course. Agriculture uses two thirds of fresh water. And Sandra, your book and your article are rife with great examples like the ones you just gave of uh, mm, thank you. technological fixes that can be used and uh, new ideas. I think science you know, does need to be focused on uh, agriculture, particularly growing crops in areas that are water scarce. I've spent a lot of my life living in very poor countries where. Um, you know, people are on the edge and uh, going into um, further poverty can be, can take almost nothing. And um, it's both water scarce areas, but then areas that are suddenly getting too much water and how do they recover their crops from that. And, you know, I don't think that there are sufficient incentives, however, for um, lots of, lot, lot more science and innovation, in part because water is so cheap in so many parts of the world. So science has always got to be thinking about how to marry itself with policy, particularly something in, for example, like water pricing issues and water alloc allocation. Um, you know, I, I thought I'd give a different answer, too, than, than my, the two scientists I'm with, which is that, you know, my observation is, I think the two people I'm sitting with remind me of um, Carl Sagan in a very good way, meaning... <laughs> Carl Sagan was a great scientist, but he opened people's minds up to a science that most people would be unaware of. And we need a lot more scientists like that. And that I think the general public and therefore decision makers, policy decision makers, are pretty unaware of the connections between water and so many other policies. Just look at the Sustainable Development Goals, where water, thankfully, is its own. It's SDG 6, but there are 17 you know, um, you know, other other goals, too, and they all interrelate, and water is at the heart of many of them. Um, whether they're the environmental ones like land and oceans or goals that are more humanitarian-oriented and development-oriented and education-oriented. Um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of um, another scientist who's great at this, who's friends with Karen Kirchnack in the audience, Bill Dennison at the University of Maryland. You know, you may know that Bill and his... Um, Center for Environmental Science at University of Maryland has, they've been the leaders in, in how to distill uh, science about particular, particular uh, basins into something that's understandable to decision makers and to the public. And so they've worked, for instance, on report cards. We see this in the Washington Post every year, the report card about the Chesapeake Bay, and it gets front page attention. It also changes policy. And, you know, new wastewater treatment investments that occur because suddenly, you know, this becomes a real, a real issue to policymakers. And I, I think that one of the main things we can do, considering that a lot of the technologies are there, a lot of what we need to know about what to do about water is there, is that we need to better uh, educate and get information out in a simpler form 
to people who are the decision makers, not just to ministries of, wa of water and you know, these technical agencies, who are exceedingly important, obviously, but to the ministries of finance around the world, to the ministries of agriculture. We need to do this in a way that's cross-sectoral and simplified and understandable to the busy person who may not, you know, may, one, not even have the time or understand the technical articles, but more importantly, also may be really questioning facts and science these days. Thank you very much, Tom, and you, you made an excellent segue to our next point because we, we talk about questions. And I'm hoping that in this room here, uh, and, and beware, I know a number of you, and so I will call on you. If I don't see people <laughs> start to line up at the mic, this room has to have questions for this panel, and, and I, I would be horrified if, if that weren't the case. So as you start to make your ways over to the microphone, I'm going to start to see some chairs move and people moving in that direction. If you don't want to walk over there and would rather try the blue cube, Brendan has that microphone and he will <laughs> pass that to you if you'd like to do that. And while we're doing that too, Eric's going to put up the next poll everywhere question so that gives everyone a chance to, again, get up out of your chairs and walk over or put your hand up and, and, and Brendan will uh, give you that microphone. The poll everywhere question is there for you. Which aspects of water security are of most interest to you on a global scale? So we're going to do a global question. The next question will be a little bit more, more focused. So, and you can respond, provide up to two responses to this one. So please uh, respond to that question and we'll, we'll, we'll get over to the, the questions in the room. Uh, Peter, I think you were first. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks so much. First, and, and joined by Bob Hirsch, my, my uh, uh, fellow Earlham College uh, uh, alumnus from uh, Richmond, Indiana. So some of you know that uh, I'm now with the Water Research Foundation, was formerly with the EPA. And, uh, and you're probably aware, too, that our foundation just went through a merger, so we get to think about the entire water sector holistically, which is, I think, a real benefit in this conversation. One of the things that I think I heard from any, everybody, but maybe no one more directly than Sandra, was the concept of unintended consequences. And, and you, you made the point about the world's population growth. You talked about ag and the tremendous water use supports ag. Of course, energy is, is another major sector for water use, both of which have been necessary to support the dramatic increases in ec economic prosperity and population growth around the world. And I think my question for you is when you think about, and Jay, you pointed to this in terms of we can't tech out of this necessarily, but tech plays an important role. When you think about the research activities that are going to be most important to help us better anticipate unintended consequences of policy directions we may take to try to solve this problem, I'm curious if you, if you can point to any things in particular. You talked about some, you know, some models, and, and, and but can you say a little bit more about what research you see as most important to help us better anticipate the potential unintended consequences of decisions we might make now to try and solve this problem? So was that for me or for you? Or for you? For oh, okay. Uh, if you want to, so I, it's an interesting question, and it's a very deep, deep and involved question. Um, you know, I think you're, when I, when I think about an answer to your question, it's sort of like they're unintended, so how do we know to anticipate them? And so that puts me really into, you know, it's an overused word now, but I think it really does sort of encapsulate my answer to this, which would be all about resilience. You know, resilience is the ability to deal with things you can't anticipate and, and be able to bounce back to you know, that some, a state similar to where you were before the thing happened. And so I, you know, I think it really is about that. There are going to be loads of unintended consequences, and not just, uh, you know, from disasters, but the, the unintended social and political manifestations of those or consequences of those. So, so it's a very society-wide thing. Um, so I think the research really needs to be around what, is, what builds resilience, um, and we're and we're doing a lot of that, but I think we need to be able to answer that question. Um, and it's it's going to be it's going to be a you know a, a work in progress for sure because we don't know for sure. But we're going to have to try some things. And I think I think research that helps us guide that resilience thinking and figure out what really can 
build that resilience. You know, we've got to experiment uh, with, with some of these um, reconnections to floodplains. And I mean, the social aspect of what's happening in Iowa and Nebraska as we're sitting here is enormous. Um, you know, the decision that an Army Corps of Engineer had to make to, you know, open a floodway and, and open, a, open a spillway, rather, from a dam and purposely flood to avoid the larger consequence of, of a dam break. Um, I mean, that's, that's a society-wide, you know, d uh, impact. And, and, and building resilience to that is, is, is critical. I just want to say, uh, Bob Hirsch is a, you know, hero of mine, so it's just great to have you in the audience. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. And, and so the, uh, one of the biggest things that we can be doing on the modeling side and, uh, is to be doing fully integrated uh, models in the context of what we call fully coupled Earth system models. So uh, models that couple the land, the ocean, the atmosphere together, so we understand those interactions. Um, but on the land side, we really need to be coupling the uh, water, energy, food, uh, and human health, and, and many other things, and we're not doing that. So a great example, and it speaks directly to Sanders' resilience point, is that groundwater helps build resilience, right? Um, but you know, we're seeing that it's, we see that it's being depleted, and yet it's really not in our major Earth system models around the world. It just came, uh, got back last night from Taipei, where I spent a week at a meeting on putting groundwater into or improving the representation of groundwater. Um, in these fully coupled Earth system models. So that's exactly what we need to do because how can we really understand the impacts of climate change on food production if we don't even have the groundwater supply and how it might be stressed in the future in our models? We don't have irrigation. We don't have the impacts of the irrigation on the food and, 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 and all that coupling. So it's a major, major frontier. Tom, please. Yeah, I just thought I'd say one thing. Um, following on Jay's comment, which is social science research on out-migration from water problems, particularly as they're continuing to be driven by climate change. I mean, just look at um, Central America, El Salvador, um, water scarcity, and then massive deluges of water, natural disasters that are further driving economic uh, deprivation, causing people to leave. and. You know, there's a big concern in this country about migration into the U.S. Well, some of these issues are extremely related to our national security interests, into migration, which people think may be driven by something else. But water is one of the core elements. And I, I think often those, those links aren't, aren't being made. Thanks very much. Bob, please. I'm Bob Hirsch, um, recently retired from the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm failing retirement. Uh, but uh, <laughs> having a good time. Thank you, Sandra, for the kind remark. Um, I want to just, first of all, say I agree wholeheartedly with essentially everything that there, our speakers have said, uh, but I want to talk about something that they didn't say, um, and it relates to agriculture and it relates to unintended consequences, and that is the, the role of nutrients in the world's uh, rivers, um, to some extent groundwater, um, and of course our estuaries as well, um, and specifically eutrophication or harmful algal blooms. In the United States, we have severe problems in places like Lake Champlain, Lake Erie, um, many, many small reservoirs, and small and large reservoirs uh, throughout the agricultural center of the nation. Uh, recently heard the Hudson River is beginning to suffer from harmful algal really? blooms. Mm -hmm. And these are a direct result of excessive amounts of nutrients uh, particularly phosphorus, and the major sources of those um, are from agriculture. Um, and and it's, we need to think about it as a, um, these nutrients as a resource. Right now they're being treated as a waste to be, to be uh, uh, limited, but in fact they are a resource. The nitrogen that feeds, so feeds the world, if you will, is, is produced the nitrogen gas is virtually infinite in the atmosphere, but it requires energy to produce it, so it feeds back to our global energy and climate problem. But phosphorus is a very, very limited global resource, and we're letting it flow to the oceans uh, and cause harm rather than using it to feed the people. So I wondered if the speakers could comment on, on the issue of 
eutrophication uh, and trying to deal with this uh, resource which becomes something harmful, which we need to really rethink into something uh, that can help us. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. I do have a section of my book on this. I think it is, it is a huge problem. And nitrogen, too, is, is, a, is one of the drivers in many locations. And, well, I think agriculture is obviously the big you know, cause, the, the runoff from agricultural lands in the greater Mississippi basin, the big cause of the, you know, the, the dead zone we see every year in the Gulf. And it, the anticipation this year is that it's going to be big because of the floods that are now carrying all of that nitrogen and phosphorus into you know, the Mississippi Basin and will go on out to the Gulf. Um, but you know, the, again, I think we have to think about land management as water management, both from a quantity and a quality standpoint. And you know, when I look at the Farm Bill, I look at it from a water perspective. You know, and, and one of the things that I think um, we could quite easily do that would have you know, beneficial effects for soil health, pulling more carbon into the soil and, and increasing the reservoir of water in the soil. And this is something I didn't know until I researched my book, that if you look globally, uh, soils have the capacity of storing as much water as all the world's rivers combined at a point in time. So that's excuse me, did I say as much as? It's eight times as much as all the water in the world's rivers combined. And yet we don't manage that reservoir, right? It's just a, it's just a consequence of how we manage the land. But we're, we're not using that soil reservoir, which in terms of a resilience uh, aspect is huge for, uh, for droughts and floods during, you know, uh, during this, this new time. And so, um, you know, getting back to, to Bob's question, I think one of the things that we could do through the Farm Bill is incentivize cover cropping. We have, you know, enormous areas of land that are basically barren during the off-season. You're not, you're losing, you know, uh, that soil fertility as a result of water and wind erosion. You're losing the soil reservoir because you're losing that, that uh, organic matter in the soil. And you're losing the nitrogen and phosphorus, you know, to the wind and water as the wind and water erosion pulls it into the into the basin. And so, three percent of our U.S. land cropland is cover cropped. We could bring that way up, and it would have multiple benefits. Uh, Maryland is one of the few states I know that uh, subsidizes uh, seeds for cover crops for farmers um, to deal with the Chesapeake Bay problem. So I think there's a way we can start to deal with it. You know, we're, we're seeing new advanced treatment units come on for septic systems, which in places like Long Island, I have a, 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 an example and story in my book on uh, the eutrophication of some of the lakes and ponds in the eastern part of Long Island, which is affecting the shellfish industry in the Great South Bay and Long Island Sound and on and on. And from, in that case, it's septic systems, which don't remove nitrogen to a large degree. And so these advanced treatment units um, can take nitrogen out, and Suffolk County, Long Island is testing those and beginning to demo which ones actually can get that nitrogen down to below 19 parts per million um, in the wastewater system. And that's a sole source aquifer that Long Island depends on. That's a sole source groundwater aquifer beneath uh, the land that's been seeing its nitrogen levels come up. So, so these are really important issues, and it has as much to do with land management as, as water management. Um, and that's, again, where we need to think of these things as as systems, uh, and not just as a water problem, but as a, but as a land and water. I think problem. Jay has a follow up, and then we'll move there. No, I see the I see the long line there. Uh, so so Bob, uh, welcome to the uh, the glass half empty club. I didn't know you were a member, so welcome. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I struggle with is the just the the overwhelming uh, scope of the problems that we face with water. And I have to say that when I think about overlaying the water quality problems with the water quantity problems that I had in the GRACE map, that's the stuff that, I, like, I go into shutdown mode. So that's how, <laughs> that's how severe it is. But to your point about the, uh, uh, the nutrient runoff, it's, it's huge. And it's something that, you know, in my group, we've tried to pursue a few times, just so this crowd knows. You know, you have to get research money to do, to to work on these problems, and sometimes you write proposals and you get them funded. And we've written proposals to put uh, agricultural runoff into our river transport models that are coupled in these in these climate models, 
and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, and mostly I've lost. Um, and so there's that reality, too, that that work needs to be done, that it, I mean, it, 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 uh, it critically needs to be done. Um, but sometimes we don't have the resources that are available to do all the things that we need to do. And so on the technology and the predictive side, society needs um, answers uh, now, right, at a, at a much faster rate than we are set up to provide. I just have one yeah. sentence on it, which is I think one additional statement would be um, obviously non-point issues are really difficult. and. Um, one area that we haven't talked about and haven't even touched on yet is um, supply chains and the power of the, the largest retailers of food, largest distributors of food, their interest in sustainability, which is growing, their uh, recognition that chemical loads and water use are part of their bottom line. And you know, I think that there does obviously need to be stronger partnership between scientists, conservationists, and these companies that have, that have an interest. And, that's one way of getting to the non-point source pollution that is faster, even if it won't solve the entire problem. Great. Thanks, Tom. We'll move to the mic here and then to, to Ellen. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Linda Lilienfeld. I do a program called Let's Talk About Water, where I use film as a way to get scientists to speak more simply to a broader public. I'm a colleague of Jay Famiglietti, and we know each other from an organization called Quasi, which is a team of scientists. And I'll try to bullet what I want to say because I talk a lot, as many of you know. Um, I think the word, um, the word resilience, uh, first, water knits it all together. So in all the different discussions, basically, if you think of it that way, everything is linked by water. Secondly, in thinking about this subject for many years as an outsider to the subject, the idea of resilience, I think, can be helped by synthesis. And the idea that the SDGs finally took water as number six, and yet it links through so many of the others. The idea of what is the point of leverage or intervention to change the very paralyzed bureaucratic structures that we all function in, from all the federal agencies to the World Bank to the uh, university structures, to move at the speed we need to move to synthesize, I think is really the challenge because the Talent and education and knowledge is there, but the communication amongst the different silos is not. So my question is to Tom Dillon specifically, which is interesting that you don't have a water portfolio at Pew, and the idea of your being a land person and a marine person over the course of your background. It seems to me that if Pew, which I think foundations are the most flexible, relatively speaking, of bureaucratic institutions. That if you could have a water portfolio and have synthesis as a way to bring water science and technology, diplomacy and governance, and add communication together and create some project where everyone is working to take these ideas and make them comprehensible to policymakers, I think we'd have a step in the right direction. What do you think about that, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you so on the spot. No, I'm really happy to be getting an, a specific idea like <laughs> that. And um, Pew, uh, at its heart, is an evidence-based, policy-oriented organization that sees its role as solving, solving problems. And, um, Writing wrongs and water is rife with them, as has been pointed out throughout the day. Um, I would like to talk more about your your question with you offline in terms of how that could be done. You know, in terms of how we break down these barriers and these boundaries that have been built over decades. Uh, and, but I'm very interested in, in that question and, and don't have a more specific answer than, than that. Well, have your girl no. call my girl. <laughs> I, but I, <laughs> no, but I have joking. an answer. I know it's Jay, very Jay has an answer. But I have an answer to it, and, and you know I have an answer to it, and that is that that's where I think the role of the universities uh, really comes in. And because we, so we're pretty nimble, and we can do that. And you know, in, in my institute, we're actually thinking about doing that, and we sort of have a prototype program called the Global Water Futures Program, which focuses on 
on Canada and is thinking about the science, is thinking about the communication, is thinking about uh, communicating to decision makers. But, you know, we need to be doing that all over the world and in all these different regions. And so it's, it's, it's tough, but it, it's, it's doable. And so there's a, that's, from my half, that's from the half full part of my class. Thank you. And I, Tom, maybe we can continue after. Yeah, I'd like to. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I'll turn to the, the catch box there, which Thank Ellen you. is trying. Is this, is this talk, working? Just talk into it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Ellen Galinsky. I am a uh, former state and federal water regulator and now a water policy consultant. And I am not lazy. I just wanted to use this box <laughs> 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 and see what it did. So um, I'm going to turn this into a slight counseling session. I. Thanks so much for your remarks. And, uh, you know, from where I stand, we know what we need to do. We have examples of successes. Sandra, you mentioned a few of them uh, today. And, um, you know, but we need to get it to scale. We need everybody to be doing these things. And it's very frustrating when we know what to do. We do need to do a better job translating the science. And I love the. Um, you know the report card ideas, and I think they're they're spreading out, uh, you know, across the nation. Uh, and we do see businesses doing the supply chain, the WalMarts of the world, but that's not enough. We need the decision makers, and in particular the politicians, to uh, wake up and make the tough decisions. And even you know, let's not even talk about this administration, but even in environmentally friendly state and federal administrations, we cannot get the right practices adopted or, um, you know, funding for them, whatever. So uh, looking to see what uh, suggestions you have to, to, to get the decision makers on board. You know, I, Ellen, I, I, love, I, I really appreciate that question. And it's one that I think we all struggle with a lot. Because um, you see these good things happening, how do you scale them up? Um, you know, and I used to be in my younger days, you know, if we just get the policies right, everything will trickle down and it'll all be good. It'll, all the right practices will get out there. And I started to turn that around and say, if we can demonstrate more solutions on the ground and point to them and say, look, this is working. There's no downside. It's economical, it's socially beneficial, beneficial to the community, beneficial to the environment. Then the policymakers will, and the communities will take note and we will see them scale up in that fashion. And that's not happening quite yet either. Um, so I don't have a clear answer other than more work on our part. I mean, I think we need to, we need to get the information out. We need to talk directly with policymakers. And you know, I, when I think about, um, you know, when I think about simple laws and regulations that have really changed our use of water. You know, one that we don't even think about was part of the U.S. Energy, uh, Energy Policy Act, EPACT, which was signed by the first President Bush in 1993. And as part of that Energy Policy Act came the plumbing, efficient, the plumbing manufacturer efficiency standards. So in that law, it said every toilet, every shower head and faucet that is manufactured has to meet certain standards of efficiency. When I was a kid, it took five or six gallons to flush a toilet. Today, you cannot buy a toilet that flushes with more than 1.6. And many are, are much more efficient than that. Today, as a result of that law, you know, we're, we, we're now, what, um, 26 years into it? We are saving 7 billion gallons of water a day without anybody thinking about it, just because our faucets, two and a half gallons a minute, shower heads, two and a half gallons a minute, you know, flushing 1.6. It's built into our urban infrastructure. It's built into every office building because manufacturers had to manufacture these uh, efficiently. And so that was a law that really didn't cost us much of anything. It just changed the technology toward efficiency. And our behavior didn't even have to change. And yet we're saving the equivalent of seven New York cities worth of water every day as a result of it. So we need to think on that scale and work toward those kinds of pieces of legislation. I mean, we all know we haven't seen anything real significant in the water realm you know, since that really incredible period between 1968 and 1973 when we had Clean Water Act and Energy Policy Act and Endangered Species Act all within a span. And we need another sort of 
you know, rocket boost toward those kinds of, of policies that are going to get us moving in the right direction. I better stop there. I'll never stop. Jay and then Tom. Sorry. Okay, so I, I have to respond to this because I've spent a vast amount of time in the space of communicating directly to Congress, <laughs> to state uh, government officials. Uh, all I have is my uh, experience to share with you, and I think uh, Sandra's comment about we just have to keep on doing what we're doing is, is quite true because that's really all we can do. My experience in California um, was one of having the good or bad for it in terms of having an impact, uh, the confluence of some major events, say the California drought in particular, the last uh, phase of the drought from, say, 2011 to 2015. It was so bad. There were so many uh, researchers working on it. So the, the uh, media was focused on it. The governor's office was focused on it. You had a big science input from all across California, the University of California system, people working on it. Um, and you also had a lot of communication, and, and, and I was a, a, a part of that. And so that was sort of a perfect storm, and that actually resulted in the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014, which is, is a big deal. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if we, you know, if we didn't have all those things converging, that we would have had the same uh, outcome. So that's I, I, I don't have the answer, but the experience suggests that you know we are more crisis driven uh, and need to take advantage of our of our crises. I also like very much Sandra your idea of doing things at small scale, showing that they work, put some dollars and cents on them. Right? If you spend this much, you can get this kind of result. If you don't spend this much. You, know, you may have these kind of impacts, and then take that to scale as well. Huh. well one quick thought um, that adds to what my colleague said. There's obviously a Venn diagram between climate change and, and water security, and water is the medium by which we're seeing a changing climate. But you know, a lot of the local organization we're seeing around climate change is not very linked to some of the water security issues. So when you're, I heard your question as about organization and advocacy, and um, you know, I think one clear thing is there needs to be a much stronger link between the two made through the advocacy organizations. When I get the email every single day from 350 degrees, it doesn't mention water very often. Yeah. It's, it's about emissions. Mm -hmm. And natural solutions are rarely brought up either. And so you know, I think there'd be a, a lot more energy uh, in water, if it, if, and this gets back to our points throughout the morning about you know, interlinking, and yeah. that's a clear and area with a lot of energy to interlink competing, with. Competing for attention, uh, especially in Congress, whether it's with climate change or anything else. Uh, I call it like the CNN effect. We know when I used to go, because I'm in Canada now, so I don't visit U.S. Congress very much, but you know, I would go in and speak with the staff of the various interested Congress members. But there'd be a line like that with people, you know, having equally important problems to discuss. And whether or not my concerns or information ever made it up the food chain, who really knows? Thanks. And, and as for any of you who were paying attention during my opening remarks, you'll note that we deviated completely from the original plan, which is good, which is good because what we're doing here, we wanted this to be a conversation and I think we're having a conversation. So I want to continue on this because we have wonderful, wonderful expertise here in the room, a lot of questions. So we're going to continue in this route. One thing I do want to do, though, is just call your attention to some of the results from this, this first poll about the, the global scale interest in water security. And I think it's just interesting. Drinking water is clearly uh, ahead of the rest. Uh, groundwater is, is uh, in, in second there. And then the regulatory policy, which we were just discussing, is third. Other issues also important, but, but those, those three are, are clear, clearly uh, at the top in, in terms of your, your concerns in the, in the audience here. And while we're moving to the next question, um, I'll have Eric put up the, the next poll question for you. And here, um, we're, we're branching out a bit because you can answer uh, four, you can respond to up to four of those, those points in, in that poll. And this is more uh, focused on the United States because we were talking globally. We're focusing on the United States with this particular question. So as that's rolling up, I'm going to turn to the mic there, please. 
Thank you. Lisa Frank with Environment America. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, it strikes me as, as you were giving your remarks and through some of the questions that a lot of the problems that we face today with water usage um, stem from practices that, that maybe made sense in the past. And I think, Sandra, you described this really eloquently. Um, you know, being able to grow food in the desert was really important when we had so many new people to, to feed. But today we're in a world where we're growing far more food than we can eat and wasting so much of it. So there's an opportunity there to start rethinking that. Um, I think another could be the siting of toxic waste facilities near waterways, such as coal ash ponds. That, that never made a whole lot of sense. Um, but as we're seeing now with natural disasters, it's increasingly becoming clear how, um, how absurd it is to keep doing that. Um, so I, I wanted to ask all of you, what are, what are kind of your top things on the wish list of, of things we're doing with water that, that simply don't make sense anymore and where there would be a lot of very clear and immediate benefits to shifting those practices and shifting our mindset. One want to take a first stab at that? Uh, I'll take a quick first stab. Um, the one for me, after spending so much time in uh, Southern California, where there are no naturally flowing rivers and a, and a river, you know, if you grew up there, you might think that um, river channels were made out of concrete. Um, so to me, um, the, you know, the need to kind of uh, rethink the channelization. Yeah, okay, so historically, and this probably made good sense, we needed to think about um, capturing our storm water, you know, treating it like an outlaw and running it out of town. And so that's how we treated it. But it turns out it's, it's critically important. And if we uh, were to rethink it again today and do it differently, we'd be thinking about having um, at least vast sections of, uh, of our rivers where water could infiltrate into the ground and recharge the groundwater, where we'd have floodplains, we wouldn't have development. Uh, it's just tough to go backwards. Um, but in some sense, I think we need to do that. Another thing we can do in the developing world is help those regions not make the same mistakes that we've made. You know, um, just yesterday we had a massive rainstorm here. And I live in Arlington, and I noticed on my walk home from the metro that, you know, almost nobody had rain barrels. And here we are in what is arguably the best educated part of this country, or one of them and in a very progressive place, and all of that water was just running off the imper impermeable surfaces. It, it is, I mean, so here we're talking about big ideas, but even, even some of the best educated people in the world are not even doing the simplest things that they, could, that they could do. There are very few rain gardens, you know? It's just amazing waste and what that's doing to, we still do have some streams right outside of Washington that, that are not impermeable yet, but they are being destroyed, of course, by these kinds of, of actions. And um, so it is right here at home, uh, amazingly, to me. And yeah, I mean, I think, uh, to me, they all kind of fall under this. Where'd you go? Uh, they all kind of fall under this category. There you are. Of, um, you know, eco <laughs> appreciating the value of nature, of ecosystem services, that we, we came very late, I think, to understanding that you know if you go back in the literature i think the first time we really saw ecosystems ecosystem services was like in the 1930s and it was you know uh not a phrase we were really concerned and that was when we were building hoover dam and starting the the age of big dams we weren't really thinking about uh the economic and social value much less the ecological value of of natural services and so i think we really only started to see that in the literature in a very uh, regular and systematic way uh, in, I would say, in the early 90s. Um, you know, and so, and so I think, you know, we, we have to give ourselves a little break that it's taken us a while to get to this point, but we don't have a lot of time now to begin to, you know, undo to some extent, redo to the extent we can, protect what we still have, um, and we're not there. You know, the policies are not promoting this yet. So we've, but I think that's, that to me, that's the big, shift. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Was there a question? Yes, please. Thanks so much. Um, Michael Zwarren from Resources for the Future. I was very interested in Sandra's discussion on how to reduce the intensivity of water usage in our economy, in agriculture, industry, other sectors. Um, I'm curious, where does the role of uh, water pricing fit into that? How we set the prices on water to encourage conservation and to rationalize the consumption patterns a little bit so we don't overuse due to 
artificially inexpensive water while at the same time addressing the equity concerns to make sure water is accessible to people who need it. Yeah, I think pricing definitely has, has more of a role to play. You know, at the municipal level, it's been a little of a mixed bag. You know, if you look at the, the water use at the municipal level, it's, it's not uncommon for, for 5% of the users to account for 30 or so percent of the water use. And those people are not going to really care. They're so rich, they're not going to care what, you know, what the price is. You know, we absolutely need to have you know, uh, a, a baseline for everyone to have their basic needs met at a low cost. Uh, and then beyond that, of course, the increasing block rate and then a, you know, a really high rate for that really high usage. But at some level, that, that doesn't do enough. So I think you need, you know, you sort of need regulatory caps as, as well. Um, but, but absolutely, pricing can make, can make a difference. There's no question about it. Um, you know, interestingly, one of the, you know, the big incentives for industrial water recycling were, was the water pollution control regulations. So there it was, you know, it was cheaper to treat and reuse than it was to discharge. And so there was a, an ans a big ancillary benefit, you know, as you know well, Ellen. <laughs> um, and so, um, but I think incentives generally have a much bigger role. Pricing, um, you know, uh, sub subsidies and incentives through the farm bill when it comes to agriculture, the equip program. Um, you know, I think we can do a lot more with incentives in general. I mean, we're just not really doing that. Both the land management issues that affect water and water quality, uh, and the and the the water use aspects as well. Yeah. Thanks very much for that. And we'll go back over to the mic there, please. We, I think we should let you answer that question. <laughs> From resources for the future, you're going to have the best educated <laughs> answer to your own question. Good point. It is a great question. <laughs> But maybe you can illuminate this for the rest of us, com coming from one of the leading economic organizations <laughs> in the country. Well, thank you for the endorsement. Um, <laughs> I'm not an economist. I, I manage programs, but I'm very interested in how our economic research and analysis can help to get to some of those questions, not only at the urban residential consumption patterns as um, was just being discussed, but also in other aspects of the economy, because you know, ag water pricing is an important question. You referenced uh, industrial water pricing and the incentives to um, pure, uh, you know, clean water and reuse it rather than discharge into the in environment. So there's a lot of role for economic analysis to help get better uh, price signals and help identify where are the financial incentives for conservation and for better usage of water resources in different aspects of the U.S. economy. So. I'm not the expert in this, but I'm just sort of interested to hear where you think there are openings for research. Yeah, just to give another example of incentive, and maybe this, so it's not just pricing, but for example, one of the things we've seen quite successful in the West are rebates um, for tearing out your turf, you know, your thirsty green lawn, and putting in desert landscaping. So you have cities like Las Vegas, Albuquerque, you know, basically paying per square foot of the turf that you pull out will pay you a buck fifty for every square foot that you pull out and, and put in native landscaping. That has been very successful in, in cities in the West. So it's not pricing, but it's an economic incentive. So I think we can get creative, you know, in that way. I want to respect the fact that folks over there have been standing for quite some time. So let's try to <laughs> try to get through those those questions over there. Uh, we're we're coming out to the last ten minutes of our time. So please go ahead. Um, Thank you for asking the water pricing question and also not leaving equity out of that because that's often missed. Um, my name is Katie Lackey. I'm with the U.S. Water Alliance. And Jay, I was really struck by the point you brought up of investing in research and also investing in emergency planning uh, to prepare for recovery for what's coming. You also mentioned in the opening remarks that we're not prepared for what's happening, um, nor let alone what's coming. And uh, I agree with that. I also think that, you know, we know uh, water quality, water quantity issues and disasters affect low-income communities and communities of color the most, even in the United States. And so I want to push back on your investment uh, points and ask, what about investment for preparation, for upgrading and retrofitting systems, for uh, water resiliency, but also community resiliency, and uh, the very difficult issue of potential relocation and managed retreat for vulnerable communities in particular. Uh, so my question to you and also the panel, 
what about investment for preparation and specifically for community for vulnerable communities? And second, how do we what do we do to get that investment when federal funding for uh, research and emergency planning has already right. decreased significantly. Right, right. and is is it at, at risk for you know other uh, emergencies that may or may not exist uh, in the United States? Yeah, right. So uh, to answer your your question, you know, very simply, I'll give it two thumbs up. I mean, uh, so we that, that's all part of the of the preparing for the future. Absolutely, um, and um, um, so. You know, let me jump to the the migration part. So, you know, maybe this community knows, but I don't think maybe the broader U.S. community knows that there are a lot of smaller communities in the United States, not at the state level, but at the sort of city county level, that are working on managed migration for various reasons, mostly coastal communities, that are that are moving back away. And you know, so this is happening. It's happening now. So we're already investing um, in it. So any of those things that that you mentioned, I think, are critically important. Now, where does the money come uh, come from? I, I don't know, but I do think, and it, this may get back to sort of how do we move forward on this and the, and the question about how to communicate. I mean, communication is super important. So we have to come together and say what we think is important, whether it's at the community level or, or you know, county or state or, or national. But um, at some point, I think that we need to demand, and this is actually in my, in my article, we need to demand from our elected officials that this is on their agenda and that um, you know this is important and it's probably your generation that's going to make that just just like you know we screwed your generation in terms of you know, ruining the planet we're also <laughs> <laughs> dumping all their future responsibility on on how to how to dig out of it to you as well uh, so uh, sorry about that uh, but uh, no, I think that we need to start to demand that our elected officials answer those kinds of questions. Um, you know, it sounds a little idealistic, but I don't have any other real suggestion. I just add one point to that. I'll be quick about it. You know, back in after we passed the Clean Water Act, you know, we had set up a federal, you know, revolving loan fund and a grant program um, that you know, enabled cities to build those wastewater treatment plants. There was federal support for that, grants and low-interest loans, right? Where have they gone, right? And so we, we have to now go back, and, and there's so much deferred maintenance in our water, you know, drinking water infrastructure in the country. And it's an opportunity, I think, to, to do it differently, but we have to support it. You know, we, you know, this is a matter of national security. We should be you know, offering federal support for green infrastructure programs and, you know, urban, uh, urban water management that builds in these resilience features. But we need to support it. You know, this is, to me, more, more important than many of the things we're spending federal dollars on. And yet we need, to, we, need to, we need to support this. So I think, and there's opportunities in this deferred maintenance to build in these new ideas, you know, to, you know, to upgrade in smarter ways that are going to, you know, keep us uh, looking you know, better for the future. I, on that, I just thought pointing out that there are major subsidies, of course, going into things like re insurance for floodplains where people are rebuilding, and that's been a major issue for a long time. But what if instead all those billions that are currently, you know, in arrears are come into preventative means rather than serving as subsidies, take the subsidies and, and reappropriate them. Okay, <clears throat> quick question. <clears throat> so Sandra, uh, you mentioned New York's investment yielding so much dividends downstream. Um, and Tom, you mentioned the Mekong and the effects on nations, other nations. Um, you also mentioned the major hurricanes and the increase. Uh, and a lot of that discussion is about climate change and sees that increase as an inevitability. Can you talk about water policy and desertification in West Africa and how that relates to the climate, ch to the hurricanes that we're seeing? Maybe Jay can. I get, I get nothing, yeah. That's a modeling question, right? I mean, is, you're talking about the, the desertification of West Africa and how it's impacting the global climate. Is that right? 
Right, all that dust is collecting water. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, so okay, go ahead. but I, I didn't get the part of the question that tried to connect, did you try to connect it to policy or, or I mean, certainly that sort of research is being done, right? And, and understanding um, what's going on with, you know, sort of gets back to our discussion earlier about the holistic nature of our models and the need to improve them. But certainly that sort of work is being done on understanding uh, land use, land cover changes, um, putting those into the global models, understanding what those feedbacks are, but then, you know, taking that to, and, you know, all of the you know, dust uh, uh, transport issues, whether you're talking about more aerosols for rain or dust transport elsewhere. Um, so a lot of that is in, the, is in the models. But then the next question becomes, you know, what are the, how does that distill down into policy recommendations? And uh, that's why I said, I've, you know, in, in that part of the world, anyway, I have no idea. I have had African students, and uh, I, uh, all I will say is that they are quite concerned about being environmental advocates uh, for, for safety, personal safety reasons. Please. Hi, I'm Hamid Karimi, working with DC Department of Energy and Environment. Uh, first of all, I want to tell Tom, we have uh, in DC subsidize install rain barrels anywhere anybody wants it. We subsidize green roof. We have one of the, actually for the last four years, we have had the highest per capita green roof installation in the entire North America. So tell Arlington people we are more than happy to share all that <laughs> stuff with them. Okay? But my question has a lot to do with not really in this area. It has to do with salinization and perhaps a little bit desertification. Uh, this is happening mostly in water poor regions of the world. Uh, we are in a water rich area. We, most of the time we are suffering from a lot of water at the inopportune time. Uh, the issue is that most of those countries, regions that they are suffering from salinization because of the dams and you know, all of that stuff that Tom, everybody talked about, also are under resource for research. And I'm just wondering whether uh, either na international institution like UN or uh, more likely Pew, uh, Pew or uh, these NGOs that they have a sort of a broad international footprint would be able to address that. This is something that regardless of the policy is going to happen and is accelerating throughout the North, Af North Africa, Middle East, uh, and you just mentioned Southeast Asia, in China, everywhere else. Thank you. Yeah, I'm certainly no expert on desalinization, I, although I just returned from Abu Dhabi, and uh, I have to say how amazing it was to understand how much of the UAE's water is coming from salinization plants. But of course, they have massive energy, cheap energy that they can use to drive it all. And, uh, genetic engineering, things that uh, essentially enables these countries or regions to use the salinized places, not to abandon them, but use new crops, in other words, convert them to some more of a productive area. You, you've just for the first time, I think, this morning brought up GMOs, which amazingly haven't come up. And, you know, and it's almost in some ways, particularly when you work uh, internationally, uh, an issue that's very difficult to discuss considering how unscientific the conversation often is, particularly in certain parts of Europe, on GMOs, and so talking about thirsty crops or, or um, the need for being able to grow in areas that were formerly less fertile is one that I, I think is, is rife with challenges because of this whole questioning of science that is, that is going on. Thanks very much, Tom. And I realize we've reached the, the end of our official time. I'm going to take moderator's prerogative because we have two extremely patient folks who have waited over there by the mic. So with your forbearance and permission, I'd like to allow them to ask their questions and then ask our panelists for a, a one minute wrap up the message you want to leave with the audience before we before we depart here. Uh, Carl, please. Thanks, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Carl Rockney. I manage the environmental engineering program at the National Science Foundation. And uh, so 
all of what we're talking about kind of dovetails with the National Academy's study that just came out on the grand challenges of environmental engineering for the 21st century. There were five of them in the interest of time. I won't go through them. But I can't help but see, um, well, there's, there's a famous saying in philosophy, right? Everything, you know, all of Western philosophy is footnotes to Plato. And I just think of all of this and I say, all of our environmental problems seem to be footnotes to Garrett Hardin and the tragedy of the commons. And, I, and I'm looking at financial incentives here, and I'm hearing a lot about talk about we have to have the proper um, financial costs of water. And I would just urge people to not just look at that. That's a very reductionist way of looking at it. Look at the water and all of the things that are required for water. There was, a mench there was discussion of the phosphorus cycle. And phosphorus, of course, is needed to produce all the food that we need. But if you look at how much water is entrained in t uh, what, it, what it requires to take all of this, uh, you know, phosphorus-bearing materials from Morocco, slurry it in a water-poor area, bring it to the ocean, bring it across to the United States, and then mobilize it and dump it into the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. This, this is really uh, a, a classic linear economy. And what we need are circular economies and looking at the full costs where water fits into every component of that. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Anyone want to add to, to that? Terrific. Eagles, please. Okay, thank you. I'm Eagles uh, Milbergs. I'm co-founder of Pure Blue, which is an accelerator in, in Seattle that helps water entrepreneurs uh, get started and scale up. I appreciate the holistic perspective you're bringing to this conversation of how water connects to food and energy and industry and the economy, et cetera, very important. I have two uh, questions. One is, how would you prioritize the entrepreneurial opportunities looking forward? If you were a holistic entrepreneur, what do you think they ought to be focused on? And secondly, if you're advising young people to go into this uh, area of trying to solve these water problems, how would you advise them in terms of the kind of education, the skills and disciplines that they ought to be focused on in order to make a contribution. Thank you. Um, well, so I'm a professor, so let me talk about some education. Um, I, I think uh, depending on a student's interest, broad-based engineering and science, and it doesn't have to be water-specific, but uh, a science, engineering, uh, you know, strong, uh, uh, strong, st strong background in science and technology, I think, is really important. Uh, for the for the fundamentals, um, but so few of our students are skilled or have any um, uh, expertise or opportunities to think about business and business opportunities and what they can do without actually having to uh, go get a master's degree or a PhD. That you know, many uh, you know, the classical training is sort of linear. You know, get degree, 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 and then and then go. And so that's not not true these days. I think in the in the uh, in the startup space. So some background in economics, uh, maybe some understanding of risk, uh, I think is really important. Uh, the role of the startups, um, I think is really important. I mean, there's just, so, we could just go on and on and on about, about different areas where, where investment could be important. Sandra was talking about membranes. I always like to talk about what to deal with, what to do with the salt from desalination, I think is, is really important. But we could go, we could go on and on. Uh, data spaces is, is is really important. Um, artificial intelligence is becoming more and more important. By data, I mean integrating data, having platforms that make the right data available, say in a community or a state or whatever, so so uh, those communities can do what they need to do. Uh, so those are those are my comments. Andrew, Tom, did you want to add anything? I mean, I have things I can say, but I can, uh, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I can say that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, before we before we close here, um, I wanted to uh, allow our uh, panelists to provide us with some final words as we leave here and go out and and share both the good news and the bad news about water on World Water Day, but also on every other day. Um, so I'm going to uh, perhaps reverse the order a little bit, and and we'll start with uh, Sandra and go back to Tom and then Jay. To final message for the audience here before we wrap up, please. Mm. And maybe I did have something to say to that last question because I'm finding it's working into what I want to say as my final remark, and that it's you know water touches 
everything, you know. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, young people going into whatever field and, you know, how we make clothes, the, the dietary choices we, we make. Uh, all these things have a big impact on, on water, you know. And so it's, it's not just the dams, the pipes, the flood, flood plains. You know, it really is a very broad societal challenge. So, you know, no matter what your interest as, you know, as a, as a student or as a young person or as an older person looking for a new purpose, you can apply it to water. You know, I was just talking with, you know, a friend's young son. Well, he's gone into this um, sort of beyond meat thing, you know, f developing products that have the satisfaction of meat but aren't meat. Well, that could have a very big impact on shrinking our human water footprint if it were to expand out. He's not a water geek in any way. He's interested in this aspect of food, but it could have a very big, so, so just, I think that was really more of an answer to the last question, but I guess I would just say, leave you with the thought that almost every example and story I have in trend, in my essay, in my book, um, are collaborative. You know, that we, I think we've been very accustomed and very spoiled in a lot of ways to leaving the solving of our water problems over the last century to the engineers. And they've done a phenomenal job, as we've discussed. But this is a really broad, you know, challenge that's going to take collaboration between scientists, policymakers, conservationists on the ground, community members, really coming together. You know, this is a, this is a, you know, all hands on deck moment. Um, and I think it's, it's an exciting time in that way. Um, but I think we have to pitch it that way in our communities. It starts with us, our homes, our communities, our local policymakers, and on up. And I think that's, that's kind of where we need to think of it and, and realize that everything, you know, is, as someone said, everything is connected through water. And to really start thinking of it that way. Thanks, Sandra. Tom? I, I want to say, really, it was a lot of fun to be here with all of you this morning. <laughs> This is a great, broad uh, discussion and very appropriate, of course, to have on, on World Water Day. And the one thing I would um, leave from this conversation with is just, I think we confirmed and affirmed the um, centrality of water in so many other topics. And um, so much of the water that we use is, is from products that, you know, we don't even realize the water it took to, to create it. And I think that those, those simple ideas are not well enough known in the American public and, and other um, citizens around the world. And one of the most important things I believe that scientists like those in the room can do is really to help open people's eyes to what their role in, um, in water security really is. And then we can get the kind of power that we need to, to change some of the problems. Um, and Jay. Uh, so my comments are essentially the same. I think, you know, I heard a number of times today, this morning, um, that people say, you know, the technology is there. It's there. I've heard, you know, a number of people say it. Um, so what's required? We need to synthesize. We need to collaborate. But the big one I want to push for is really the translation and the communication. And that's communication that this is by all of us. Uh, so it's, you know, two various groups. It could be uh, to the community. It could be to water managers. It's, so in my case, you know, I was trying to share research that we've done. Uh, it could be to decision makers. It could be to elected officials. And so there is a grassroots element to all of this that we have to own um, the water issues that we face and stress how important they are to us and to communicate that any way we can. Thank you very much, Jay. So with that said, um, it's been a terrific 90, oh, close to 100 minutes, sorry about that. Um, it's been a terrific morning. Uh, thanks in large part to the participation from all of you being here, asking these excellent questions. So as you please join me in thanking our fantastic panel, please extend a hand also to yourselves. Uh, thank you all very much and thanks to our panel.